Folks, welcome to another edition of Real Estate Experts. As always, I'm your host, Glenn Twiddle, bringing you leading experts from around the country and around the world to help you, the home seller, traverse the minefield that is the real estate landscape, whether that's building wealth through property, buying for bottom dollar so you can get a good deal, selling for top dollar so you can maximize your investment, whatever it's got to do with property, we've got you covered. And today I'm honored, I'm I used to study from this woman. I learned a whole bunch of stuff from her. She has been a serial property investor. She's an author, speaker. What she hasn't done in the real estate space is not worth doing. And I'm really honored to be interviewing one of my mentors in many ways. I'm talking about none other than Jen Castle. Jennifer, thank you so much. I feel like I shouldn't be saying Jen, but it's <laughs> Jennifer Castle, but you know, you'll always be Jen to me. Thank you no so worries, much. Glenn. Wow. So our viewers don't know you, and they certainly, some of them don't know your business acumen. But before we get to that and how to help our viewers kind of traverse the property landscape, tell us about, um, from what we've discussed in the past and stuff, there's been like a resurgence in one of your hobbies in kind of how rock climbers are now getting some exposure on TV shows and they're getting all famous with this Ninja Warrior thing. But tell us about your experience in the rock climbing world. Well, I've been climbing for as long as I've been selling real estate. <laughs> so, in fact, even a bit longer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, rock climbing is a passion of mine, um, and I find that you know when you really, at, with real estate and lots of other professions, you know, it takes a lot of your time, a lot of your energy. Uh, a lot of people would use yoga, would use meditation, you know, all those sorts of <laughs> things. But I can't do that because it's not active enough, <laughs> and I need the activity and I need the thrill and the excitement and everything else. So I go rock climbing and I think of it as yoga on a rock. Nice. And yeah. like our mate Stallone, because we, you know, we've spent, obviously I've invited oh, you well, to come and see. Cliffhanger yeah, from the Cliff 90s yeah. with our mate Stallone. I know. From fabulous, <laughs> fabulous. And Tom Cruise does it too, you know, a mission. Oh, of course. Yeah, 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 yeah. Angelina Jolie does it. Wow. Yeah, no, it's awesome. I love it. Yeah. So uh, rock climbing, yoga on a rock. Very nice. So. Now, why I picked you, I got Jen in for a very specific purpose to help you guys out. So I really want to know about, our viewers are asking me all the time about, you know, it seems like whenever they're ready to sell a property, there's a hundred real estate agents jumping all over them saying, pick me, pick me, pick me. And they all say a good stuff at a listing presentation. And, but sometimes they all look a bit the same. What I'm after from you is, how important is the choice of choosing a good real estate agent or all these ones that all sound the same can we just kind of just choose one well that's a really good question and, and I guess a lot of homeowners have to uh, sort of come across this when they are choosing real estate agent because real estate agents basically have an ABC of what to say mm -hmm. when they come in to present to an owner yep. and quite often it is exactly the same I'm going to get you the best price I'm going to do it in the quickest time um, some of them will come in with, I'm going to be the cheapest, or I'm not, you know, I'm not going to cost you a lot of money in marketing, I'm going to do it for you, or you don't need to market. But those two first ones, they're the main ones. I'm going to mm. get you the best price. And yeah, I know a lot of my viewers ask about time. those second two as well. So those four are often what the agents come in with. Yeah. yeah. And are they the wrong criteria to be kind of looking for? Well, uh, every agent will say that, um, but how can you... How are you really going to know? Yeah. You know? If every agent says it's going to be, I'm going to be the fastest, or I'm going to be, you know, get yeah, they your can't all be right, can they? They can't all be right. And the, yeah. the thing is, you only get to sell your house once. Mm. So if you make the wrong choice, you'll never know mm. if there was someone else who was going to do it better. So it's really actually important to to kind of find out what is the agent going to do mm. to make sure that you're going to get the best price and what is the agent going to do to to make sure you sell it in the quickest time and is the quickest time going to equate to the best price yeah or is that important to the seller because sometimes speed might be more important than price That's and sometimes right. price is paramount and time is the variable that we might have a few months or something that's exactly mm. right. Yeah. So I think that um, uh, there's there's so many agents out there sort of making all of these promises. Um, but if you actually go and do, a, and it's been done, a secret shop of agents. Okay. Um, uh, 150 agents were sort of uh, shopped over a period of time to see how effective they were right. at so that's, home opens. Right. So that when you say, so for our viewers, that's 
going to visit an agent to see if they're walking the talk as opposed to just talking it? That's exactly okay. right. And um, before I started um, uh, selling in the area that I'm in, I secret shopped the agents of my area okay. as well. And okay, how so did they stack up in your area? Well, it, it pretty much was exactly the same as the study that was done, which I, I believe was done mostly over in the eastern states. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it was surprisingly similar. A lot of the time you walked in and the agent didn't request any details from you at all. Mm. They might have said hello and um, uh, welcome to the home and that's kind of it. You know, so you, you just get to walk through the house, comment to each other if you're there with your, you know, a friend or your husband or something, um, and then literally walk out and the agent hasn't asked a single question of wow. you and they certainly haven't got any of your details. Mm. Every so they couldn't then, follow up if they wanted to. If exactly, that's the case. exactly. And didn't know who you were or <laughs> what you were even doing there. They didn't mm. know if you were a buyer, they didn't know if you were someone from the neighbourhood mm, just having research, a look or, yeah. mm. you know, nothing. Um, then there was a percentage of agents and it was a much smaller percentage who actually did get the details. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, they've made an effort to, to take your name and everything. Maybe have asked a couple of questions, maybe not, but they have taken your details. Mm, okay. But of the ones that took the details, it was like less than a third would, at, well, in fact, much less than a third would even follow up with a phone call or a text message wow. asking about the property. And one of the interesting stats uh, of that study was that one third of, uh, two thirds of the agents didn't even follow up, like at all. Mm -hmm. And then a third of those weren't even particularly nice wow. or polite. I mean, that stuns me that, you know, because when I get to meet agents that are leading the field like yourself, you know, and again, you, you've you literally written the book on this and I'm going to get cheeky in a minute and I'm going to ask for a copy for our viewers. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I get to meet the best of the best agents and when I hear, because I've had that, st that study quoted to me a couple of times before, it just seems to be par for the course that you should be nice and leave no stone unturned for your sellers. Is the bar really that low that the agents aren't trained to do, this seems like common sense to me. I don't know, what's your take on it? On why? Why is that the case? Unfortunately, I think uh, that the bar is set pretty low for mm. the, the level of entry to become a real estate agent. Um, you know, it's what a three day course yeah. <laughs> that you can't fail. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I've, I've heard that it's the job you get when you can't get a job elsewhere. So, yeah, so it's, it is a shame, isn't it? That, you know, it's a, it's a four year apprenticeship to cut hair or work on a car. That's right. And they don't let you touch a head of hair for a year of sweeping before, you know, it's crazy that they let people at our, our viewers' biggest assets with a three-day course. So I think that's probably one of the things that a, a, a seller would really want to make sure of is that they are going to be getting an agent who is in that top third. Mm, that okay, so that they're are, nice. They're nice. <laughs> and, and they follow up. What else? How, I mean, you're known for your marketing. You know, some of the stuff I studied from you was your marketing prowess. It's second to none. Tell me about um, how marketing fits into that equation. In that secret shop, when we see the agent's marketing materials, how do we know oh. the Jen Castle from the, from well, the, the also rands? Absolutely, like I mean, I, I know when I went around just to the 15 or so agents that were in my area, um, the percentage, the very high percentage of people that had very cheap looking um, you know, marketing material, photocopies, things that were on perhaps on a slight angle ah, on the page. So it was clearly printed in the office, just run off and... Yeah, and, and it doesn't do any justice to the house. Well, and it's it, a half a million dollar asset. I mean, think about it. if we were selling this board table, we'd get professional photographers in there and they, they take a photo right. on their iPhone and print it. That, it that's the me. other thing, it, it, exactly. <laughs> when you go online and you actually look at properties that are for sale and you might have a, an, an area that's quite uh, upmarket and elite, and you're looking through a whole heap of iPhone photos where people have left the rubbish bins sitting in the floor, middle of the kitchen floor or... Creepy dirty, crawlies sitting there in the yeah, pool. Yeah, in the pool, dirty laundry in the laundry, you know, mm. curtains sort of half askew on the windows. Yeah. And you think it's, it's so simple to just go and fix up those little things at the very least. 
But who would hire somebody taking a photo on their iPhone today? Mm. That's mm. got to be a big question, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, agreed. Yep, agreed. Yet Anything else happens. on? So if that's what not to do, dodgy photos, photocopied brochures, etc. What should they be doing? When our viewer says, wow, that's a person that is going to maximise top dollar for my property, what would some of those things look like from a marketing well, the, perspective? Well, at the very least, they should be having professional photography and the photography itself should be beautiful. Mm. So it's not just having a professional photographer because, you know, there's quite a lot of them as well. Mm -hmm. So the photography for the property should be beautiful and it should be well presented online so that it follows some sort of natural sequence. Mm. A lot of people just throw the photos up as they're taken. Mm. And so you see the front yard and then the study and then the backyard and then the, the bathroom. And oh, then okay, so order of photos is yeah. a, wow, see I love your marketing brain. Yeah, nice. so when the person should feel like they're coming to the, 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 front, of the front yard, through the door, into the lounge, ah, the okay. kitchen, you know. So the, mm -hmm. the photos themselves follow a logical sequence so that the buyer can follow the flow of the house very simply. So that's at the very least. Mm. However, I, should, um, I would actually be looking for somebody who does a video. Mm -hmm. Then again, the quality of the video. Mm -hmm. Is the agent presenting it as um, a, a slideshow with, with uh, music? Right. Elevator music. Which so that's is what a, not to do. Not to okay. do. Um, or is it more like uh, an episode of Better Homes and Gardens? Okay. So because I've seen you host your own videos where you're on yep. uh, those videos. So again, it's clear to see you know that um, y you would do that because you uh, you know you're no stranger to the camera and all of that. But should other agents be doing that or is it just for, you know, um, models? I'm just, <laughs> I don't mean to be, it's, it's, it's no mistake that you've done, you know, it's, it's no coincidence that you've got experience in being in front of the camera in various, and you're bringing that skill to your real estate career. Should all agents be doing that, hosting the videos? Uh, well, I'd like to say yes, but of course everyone has a different ability set uh, mm. or skill set, you know, in front of the camera and... Um, mm. Well, I suppose, let me reword, does it add something to the video on behalf of your seller for you to be, I suppose, the star guiding people around online through a tour of the property? Absolutely, because when the buyers come, they know who I am. Right. And straight away, it's broken down a barrier in communication immediately with the buyer. They go, I know who you are. Hi, how are you going? You know, and I get handshakes and uh, greeted by name. Uh -huh. um, I can then have a much more natural conversation with the buyer when they come into the house, and they're much more likely to tell me things that I want to know and my seller would like to know, but the buyer doesn't necessarily know they're giving away, yeah. like uh, their budget. Yeah, okay. So the negotiation <laughs> starts at the video. Oh, absolutely. Wow. Yep. Yep. Interesting. Okay, cool. So that look, I'm I'm with you. That if we get good quality marketing materials, the video and all those things, while we're secret shopping these agents, it'll probably be pretty clear where we're dealing with a Gen Castle rather than um, you know one of the the ones that might not be worth their dollars. So, my next question is: You mentioned it before, where you were talking about some agents will lead on cost. You know, one yes. of those four criteria you talked about. That one of the things the agents will say: Hey, hey, list with me because I'll be cheaper. Tell me about how. Because we all want to get a good deal. We all want to end Absolutely. this with the most money in our pockets. So tell me how the cost of the agent factors in when making these decisions. Well, I guess it's very natural for us to always be looking for the cheapest deal. It's yeah. part of our psychology. I mm -hmm. mean, I think we're trained it from very <laughs> young to, you know, check, price check and you know what we're like. We're running around from Harvey Norman to There's good guys. There's apps on the phone now. <laughs> Oh yeah, that's that, right. Where you can do compare it. those things. <laughs> Absolutely. Like, have you seen those? You can scan the barcode, and it'll tell you where the item is. That's a bit Harvey cheaper. Norman and all that. That's cheaper. Yeah. So. So we're definitely indoctrinated for that principle. I we get. We are. Yep. You know. So um, it's quite easy for a vendor or a seller to to also apply this to a real estate agent mm -hmm. because they think they're comparing apples to apples. You know, they're yeah. thinking that every real estate agent is the same and the one differenti differential is the price or mm. the fee. Mm. Uh, unfortunately, when you go shopping for apples, 
if you actually are really shopping for apples, you'll know that every apple is different because you'll see people pick up each apple and look at it and decide, I'll have that one, no, I won't have that one, mm. I'll have that one, I won't have that one. So even an apple can have imperfections. So when it comes to picking an agent, you've got to understand, I suppose, that the cheapest agent isn't necessarily the one that is the cheapest fee. Mm. The cheapest agent is the one that will get you the most money. Mm. Because the more money you have in your pocket, the less it's actually cost you, the uh -huh. more profit you've made. Well, I've heard some of your sellers say that you paid for yourself, that you covered oh, your own fee. Absolutely. So you were free effectively. Now, again, yeah. that may not be what everyone can promise, but I see what you're saying, that if you are getting the most money, you pay for yourself with the extra dollars you're getting from the buyer. And once again, it's one of those things that's really hard to test because once you've sold your house, you've sold it. You never get to sell it again and see if there's yeah. a difference. That's why it's so crucial, isn't it, to apply these formulas? It is, it is. Mm. Uh, where you can see it, however, is when you take a listing over from another agent. Mm. So say, for example, you might have a, um, the opportunity to work with somebody who's perhaps been a bit disappointed originally. Mm -hmm. um, it's happened to me a few times now where I've come into a listing and the agent beforehand has only been able to get an offer of let's say uh, 875000 and it wasn't enough for this person to take. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we then went in, restyled their house, redid all of the marketing, relaunched the campaign, held an auction campaign and sold the property for 940000 wow. in five weeks. So so our view is we need to not miss that. That's 65,000 extra, is that right? Yeah, 945. Uh, yeah, nine, And it was 875 yeah, yeah. that they were they couldn't get. They couldn't. Yeah, they well, couldn't they sell, didn't they, they couldn't sell they for that. They couldn't sell for that, yeah. Yeah. So 65 grand if that other agent was 2 grand more or 3 grand more on their fee, that differential is the 63, not the 2. Well, you know, you know, even if that mm. agent was probably um, a similar sort of price point to me, but let's say it was a discount agent. Wow, yep. You know, it, they might have had a $15,000 difference in our fees. Yeah. But it still wouldn't have been yep. a cheaper yeah. agent. It would have been the most expensive discount it you've would ever have been, Yeah, exactly. Wow, so definitely it's clear that these, this decision shouldn't be just eeny, meeny, miny, mo. And that's how I've seen many of our viewers ask. They say, can I just pick one, you know? Yeah, yeah. okay, interesting. How does then the marketing factor into that? Because I know there are some agents that say they, you mentioned it before, some agents mm. will throw in the marketing. Some agents, give you a bill that's like a huge bill and everywhere in between. And like you just said, yeah. you're not the most expensive in the game in either one of those places, but nor are you looking like you, you'll do it for free. So how does marketing expenditure factor into that? Well, marketing uh, is, uh, there used to be a lot of emphasis on marketing, then there was none. You know, so I can understand why sellers get really confused. Yeah, because this realestate.com came along or rewa.com in your neck of the woods and agents could sell for free so, you know, I suppose some would you argue they could. Online, yeah, yeah, you could get online for free. So how yeah. does that, how do our sellers kind of, what's the word, make heads or tails of that? Well, the, the easiest way to make a decision I find for marketing is to think about the implication of allowing an agent to cover the cost of your marketing. Mm, okay, so if the agent is saying, free. yeah, we'll throw it in. Yeah, okay. it's not free. Someone's paying for it. In this case, it's the agent. Mm. As soon as the agent is paying and often upfront for some of the marketing, they're out of pocket. Okay. As soon as an agent's out of pocket, believe me, they want to put the money back in their pocket. Okay. Really quickly. Mm. You know, they can't afford to be holding out for those funds for a multiple number of listings over a period of time. Okay. So what does that do to their demeanour in the marketplace? Well, what happens is they now have a financial investment in your property. Mm -hmm. So when you go to, to uh, perhaps they get an offer, they're more interested in you accepting an offer mm. to recoup so their... they can recoup their expenses. They now have a financial interest in whether or not you accept that offer that um. is above and beyond their success fee because yeah. they've actually had an expense. It's not just their time now. Mm. So I find that when uh, a seller allows an agent to pay for their marketing, they lose two things. First of all, they lose the ability to complain about the marketing if they don't like it. Mm, okay, yeah. Because they didn't pay for it. 
Got it. And secondly, the agent now has a financial interest in their property and can't be necessarily working on their behalf or yeah, in their best saying. interests. You can see that their, their motivation now goes from, which legally they're responsible, they're mm -hmm. supposed to be legally obligated to get top dollar for the seller, period. Absolutely. Would you say that there's the chance, and I'm not saying with all agents, but there's Absolutely. the chance that that legal obligation gets somewhat compromised, tainted, or even gone, that it goes back to get the deal done so I can get my three grand back or whatever the case may be. Exactly. And you might think, well, it's only three grand, but if that agent is carrying 10 listings, yeah. it's now 30 grand. Mm -hmm. And that can be quite painful. Yeah, understood. You know? Understood. And we, uh, wow. So, I mean, well put, and uh, it certainly goes to show that you can't just take everything at face value on these things. You need to be watching shows like this to do your research. Well done. Yeah. You've talked about a principle in your book. Actually, now I'll avail myself of my opportunity to get cheeky. Okay. Can I get cheeky? I know you're selling it on Amazon. I know it's doing really well, but can I get cheeky and get a copy for our viewers? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? There you go. I'm negotiating with the ultimate negotiator. So uh, go to the URL down there and grab yourself a copy of Jen's book. It'll go into more detail on some of these subjects. So thank you for that. No worries. In the book, and I think I've even read some articles and seen some stuff that you've written about buying the listing. Oh, um, yes. and, and you know, you've explained in your articles what that is, where an agent might overprice or, actually if you could explain it, what is buying the listing and tell me why it's such an easy trap to fall for that you've wrote, written about it so, so uh, passionately. Yeah, I've even uh, done a, a rant on it on my... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, this is something that I'm actually pretty passionate about because, um, look, it's so... Well, first off, what is it? Oh, okay. Buying a listing is when an agent will come into your property and play on your emotional connection with the property by telling you a price that is not realistic but sounds fantastic. Yeah. Okay. okay. So every... <laughs> You know, everyone, their house is worth more than everyone else's, right? <laughs> it, it is. I'm sitting there thinking I'm guilty. Yeah. More, you know? I'm sitting there thinking I'm guilty. <laughs> we all think our house is worth more than the person's next door or, you know, the one that's sold down the road. So you're, an agent can really play on that. You know, to, in order to win the listing, if they tell you a figure that makes you really, really excited and really, really happy, and then another agent comes in and gives you a realistic figure that's substantially less... Yeah, I can see how they, yeah. You'd think, well, I might be losing $50,000 mm -hmm. by going with this agent who comes in with this so-called market price. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go with the guy who tells me 50 grand more because mm. if he thinks he can get it and he does, yeah. I'm going to be in a better place. So, Jen, tell me the flaw in my thinking then because I've been there as a seller and I know this is embarrassing because I'm supposed to know a thing or two about this hosting this show. I know, it's so hard. Uh, why is it flawed <laughs> thinking? and I know from experience why, but I want your take on it for our viewers, to go with the person who promises optimistically, let's just give them the benefit of the doubt, that it's just optimism, you know, and then drop the price if they are too optimistic. Why is that a mistake? Because it sounds like common sense. We start there and if the market's not willing to pay that, ah, oh, we'll drop to where that realistic place is. Well, look, the first four weeks on the market are actually the most important because that's when you're going to get the most amount of interest in your property. And if you put the price up too high, your risk is that you'll completely miss out on the strongest part of your marketing campaign. Okay. Because those buyers, the ones, the real buyers for your home, the, the people that you can actually get into a, comp a competitive arena and perhaps then increase the price, don't even come. Mm. Okay. And you might have actually run the risk of not getting any attention at all from the marketplace. Mm -hmm. No one comes to the home opens. No one looks at your property, um, your listing on the internet. Then what happens is let's say, you know, because we do get ambitious and then we want to hold out and we want to hold out for another week and another week and it might be three or four weeks before we do come down in price. Mm -hmm. And then when you do come down in price, you've already missed that first month of the market. Mm -hmm. Now you're playing catch up. As the time on the market increases, naturally the interest in the market decreases. As you're decreasing your price now, you're now trying to catch the market all the way down 
And quite often what happens is you'll sell for under market value. What you could have done. So that's yeah. the biggest risk. Mm. Um, the second thing that can happen is that the agent could deliberately tell you a high price to win the listing because they're using this emotion and then immediately start beating you up on price from the moment you start the campaign within a day. Wow. They so, I mean, be, yesterday you were telling me it's 100 grand more, but now? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and that causes a tension between you and the agent, mm. which uh, can cause distrust. And then from then on, the whole journey can be rocky and you never really know what's, what's happening. Mm. How would you feel if you sold your house, not really sure if the agent got you the best price? Yeah. Yeah, no, you need to know that. You need to know they did. You need to feel yeah. it, don't you? Agreed. You need to walk away going, that was the best I could get in this market and that agent worked darn hard for me. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So that's the, the, the problem with it. Mm. Now, how do we know that the agent is overpricing? Yeah, that's yeah. I suppose my question that went in my head is, is it naive optimism, right? Is it naivety? Is it deception, as you've kind of talked about? Or is it, like in your case, I've seen the list of accolades of sellers uh, from, that you have sold for that are saying how much more money you got them than was out there. So how do we know the difference between A, B and C? Exactly. So what it comes down to is how, when the agent gives you a price for, for a property, what is their logical and sound reasoning behind that price? Mm. What is the evidence that they're using? Is it the same sort of evidence? Is it the same sort of properties in the same area? Do they have a specific reason for being able to ask more for your property that they can articulate clearly? Mm. That makes sense. Do they talk about the way buyers respond to properties? Do they have that sort of uh, psychological analysis of buyer behaviour behind them to support that decision to go for a higher price? Yeah. You know, so it's, it's not so much a question of, um, uh, is that price right or wrong? Is, is there, it's more, is that price given for a very good reason? Yep, got okay. it, got it. So if you could say, when you can show, because I've seen your accolades, when you can show this is a property that we estimated was worth X, and when we got Y, even in a market that's a bit tight, like WA has been for the last couple of years, you've got market value, and then you've got Gen Castle value, and, 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 et cetera. So when you can show that track record, then a slightly higher price that we might be going for is justified and you can give a valid reason for doing so. And also I have a, a fairly um, good process mm. that I would use to um, engage buyer emotional decision making yep. factors. Because mm. uh, if you can get buyer emotion involved, then you're going to get a higher price. Um, no, so there's, there's lots of things behind how to get a price for a house, but to just sit there and say, I reckon I can sell this house for 1.2 million when all the sales evidence is around 1 million. Yeah. You know, and you know you're, you're on the risk of that being the trap. And I see yeah. it happen all the time. I see mm. properties come on the market and I, there may be even properties that I've gone in as an agent and, and actually done a presentation as well. They've gone with another agent and listed it two or $300,000 more than what I've said. Are those and ones I'm, that you get back and you have to fix <laughs> later sometimes, you talked about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm the agent that fixes other yeah. agents' listings. Yeah. <laughs> uh, your reputation very well deserved. Um, so, Jen, thanks so much for this. And before I let you go, though, I did have a viewer ask me a question. They said to ask my next guest, so I want to ask you this. Um, in this market where it's not as certain as it was in the boom times of 2008, and I know that you've been, you've seen all the markets, booms, busts, recoveries, yeah. you've seen them all. <laughs> How does the agent with the most sales factor in? Because sometimes I know that you, you know, as an author, as a, as a person in your position, you get to pick and choose the sellers that you want to work with. Some agents may not be in that position where they think more is more is better, but tell me how, it would make sense, I would think, for our viewers to say, well, if they've sold 100 properties in that area or 30 properties in that area, that that would be the agent to go through. How does that factor into the decision-making process for our, our viewers? Well, that's a really interesting question because um, lately there's been a lot of agent referral sites. Oh, there's a bunch of them, aren't there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And one of the criteria they use is number of sales oh, okay. in an area. Okay, so um, a seller might not really... 
have a choice of an agent clear in their head, so they might go onto one of these sites. I think even realestate.com does I one I believe now. they do, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Where and they so just some of those sites, and let's just make a sidebar note, some of those sites are claiming to be impartial, but they only go to agents who will pay them a fee That's of correct. 20 to 40% of the, the commission yep. goes to this impartial, impartial site. site. Yeah, free, free to the seller. Yeah, yeah. free to the seller, but there's a, that's an expensive free, like we were talking about before. It is, because not every agent, especially not uh, really good agents, necessarily will be on that site. That's exactly so, right. Um, but some of them will list everyone, and they list them by a number of sales in a, a suburb, and that seems on the surface to make sense. Mm -hmm. Oh, they must be good because they've done a lot of sales. Mm -hmm. But uh, there's agents out there who have been in areas just a long time, mm. you know, and they know a lot of people in that area and they become like a bit of a default agent for a lot of clientele because they feel like they'd be doing the wrong thing if they then used another agent because they know this person, you know, they might be involved in their local community or mm. their school group or maybe they've been in local government or, okay. you know, so they've, they've got relationships that they've built up and they become the default agent. Mm. Now, there's nothing wrong with that, but it doesn't mean they're the best. Mm, okay. It doesn't mean that they're getting the best result for their clients. It just means that they've been around a long time and they know a lot of people. Okay, so still apply the same criteria that you're talking about, because they may be the best, That's we still right. want to apply the criteria. Yeah, so still have a look at um, what's the, their ability to negotiate, mm -hmm. test it out, go check them out at home opens, make sure what they're doing, because uh, I do know one agent who is, uh, who's been in the area a very long time and you go to the home open and you're lucky to get a hello. Wow, that's Never one of those ones, no follow-ups. No follow-up, <laughs> nothing, you know, but they've been there a long time. Mm, okay. you know, so um, another good question to ask an agent is what is their list to sell ratio? Mm, okay. So of all the listings that they get, what percentage of them actually go through to settlement? Okay, what's, a, it, what's, a, what's a gun? What, like what's someone who's, What's the right number, that or above, that we should be looking for? Well, you, you can probably never get 100%. Mm. Uh, my list to sell ratio is around 97%. Okay. That's pretty good. So that's most. You take on 100 listings in any given year, three of them may not sell for market condition. And that's actually incredible given the state of the WA market, because I've heard blood on the streets has been a term that has been used. Yeah, yeah. So to be virtually all of them is like incredible for that marketplace. That's right. And and, and that's a really good thing to know when you're mm. um, getting an agent to represent your home is how successful are they in general? Yeah. You know, what is your chance of, of actually selling the home? Well, that brings up what would be a number that we should run from? or Because surely if it's only four in 10, they're not going to say, oh, it's 40%. What That's are they right. going to say if it's bad? Uh, they won't know what it is. Uh, okay. <laughs> so how would they answer it? So Jen, just pretend this is, this is good stuff for you guys. I'm a seller. Be that agent who, I'm just trying to hypothesize what they would say if they can't say virtually all of them out of the last 100 sales I've done, 97, and here are the 97 phone numbers, or here's the 100 phone numbers of those sellers. Please call them and ask them how my services are. If an agent can't be as confident as that, what might they say? So, Jen, what's your list to sell ratio? Um, oh, um, oh, I've never been asked that question before. Was what most of them would say? Okay. Um, or they, or they won't know what it is, what it means. Mm. But uh, if somebody said their list to sell ratio was sixty percent. We need then, to run. <laughs> well, if somebody else said it was ninety percent, yeah, you know, um, so that's that's it's. But once again, by itself, it's not the whole picture. Yeah, because you could sell a lot of properties because you underprice them. Mm, okay. So there's a combination of that's a good point. the highest price, the ability to negotiate, the list to sell ratio or the success rate and the marketing, wow. you know, you combine all of those things together and how do they treat people at home opens? <laughs> wow. So. so there's a lot to cover off on. And again, I'm really appreciative. Guys, grab yourself a value self of Jen's book because it goes into far more detail with checklists and ways to, I suppose, now that you certainly can see, I'm sure, that all agents aren't created equal. And if you're doing the any, meeny, miny, mo approach, you are literally Odds on to be choosing someone that is going to cost you money, not make you money. So grab yourself that book. 
it'll be a great resource for you in uh, in treading this uh, landscape. Jen, thanks so much for catching up. It was no uh, worries. A, it was uh, great uh, to see you again. Glenn. Wow, ditto, <laughs> ditto, and um, congrats on all the wins in a marketplace that is less than ideal for many agents. Congrats on the on the continued success. It's a credit to your uh, your history. Great, thanks. No worries. So guys, on that note, another episode of Real Estate Experts in the Can. What an honor it was to interview Jen Castle. Do avail yourself of her book. And until we catch up with another expert, I'm Glenn Twiddle. Bye for now.